Hello everyone, I'm Norman Wildberger and welcome to Algebraic Calculus. In this video we're going to start looking at tangents, which is traditionally part of differential geometry, but we just need enough about that story to make some nice calculations in the integral calculus side of things. So the, uh, the tangent line story is uh, one also that has a long history, but it's not really quite as deep a history as the integral calculus. So um, here's the basic story. We have a curve and we have a point on the curve. And we're interested in getting a hold of this line, this tangent line, to the curve at the point which best approximates the curve near that point. All right, so that's a kind of a geometrical definition. The tangent line to a curve at a point meets the curve only once near A and approximates the curve there. So if we magnified the region around there, then the curve and the tangent line would look pretty close. Okay, this is rather an informal definition, so we just should take this as an initial orientation. But nevertheless, this problem of finding tangents to curves became a very big topic in the 17th century. People were actually interested in calculating or constructing tangents to curves. So quite a few illustrious people studied this problem, including Fermat and Descartes, Roberval, Hud, Sluis. They all developed techniques for computing or calculating tangents. Descartes said that this was the most useful and general problem that I know in the context of geometry. And Fermat put that to use in the very explicit uh, problem of finding maxima and minima of functions. Or actually, perhaps local maximum and local minimum might be a little bit more accurate. So here we have what we informally might call a function, traditionally y equals f of x. And we see that at this point here, at the point x1, it's reaching a local maximum. It's bigger at x1 than it is at nearby points. And here at x2 we have a local minimum, and over here at x3 we have another local maximum. And Fermat realized that we could find those local maxima and minima by essentially having control over tangent lines because at those points the tangent lines are going to be horizontal. It's a key insight of Fermat. So we can find these points by finding out when the tangent lines are horizontal. But the problem of finding tangents actually goes back to the ancient Greeks. In particular Apollonius was well aware of the importance of tangents to a conic and he was in fact in possession of constructions of tangents. And one particularly interesting approach is through this idea of polarity. That to a conic we can actually associate a correspondence between points and lines. In such a way that the, the point approaching the curve means that the line approaches the tangent uh, to the curve at that point. So this polarity, I want to give you a very quick uh, sort of idea of how it goes. We're not going to go into details. I just want you to see how, how it could be used to solve this problem of actually constructing a tangent. Suppose we're given a conic like this and we actually need to make a very exact uh, construction of the tangent at that particular point A. How are we going to do that? So let me uh, illustrate uh, something. Let's see if I can make it work. So let's choose a point uh, somewhere here and I'm going to construct the polar of this point, which is a line somewhere. It'll be somewhere out here somewhere. And how I'm going to do that, and this was known to, um, to Apollonius, I'm going to choose two lines that pass through this point, and hopefully I can do this in a way that's not going to be uh, too difficult. So these uh, two lines determine four points on our conic, and the four points have some auxiliary lines um, that we can draw that one and that one. They're kind of opposite things. And they will meet at a, another diagonal point, if we like. Maybe I'll put it in a square. And then there's another two set of lines, of opposite lines. That one there and this one there. Okay. And they will meet at that point there. So having done that, then we can, and I might use a different color, then we can construct the line through these two diagonal points that we've just made. And that turns out to be the polar of the original point that we started. I might call 
color that one red. Okay, so that the dual or the polar of this point is that line. And remarkably, as Apollonius realized, this is independent of the actual lines that we chose through the point to make the construction. Very beautiful fact of projective geometry. Okay, so how can we use this? Well, let's do the same kind of thing again, but I'm just going to uh, first draw a line in green uh, through our point A that we're actually interested in and the point that we've just been analyzing. Okay. And let's choose another point on that uh, line. Let's say this point here and do a similar kind of story to find the polar of this point. Okay. So I'm going to do the same kind of thing. I'm going to uh, choose two lines that go through here. Maybe I'll, I'll use dotted lines. Okay. And maybe... Uh, so we're going to get uh, these four points. Where's the other one? Over here. And now I have to find the other two diagonal points of this quadrilateral. So I have to join these up. So if I join those ones up, I get another line sort of like this. And if I join the other two up in this direction, I will get a line that looks sort of like this. And they're going to meet down here in the corner somewhere. Okay, and we'll make a square around there. And then well, we're still talking about these sort of dotted uh, quadrilateral points. There's still another uh, set of lines that are formed by those four points. There's this line here and this one here. Okay, so we get another diagonal point. And then if we connect these two, uh, we're going to get a, the, the pole of this one here. So maybe if I color this one green this time, and I will draw the dual... Uh, roughly to go in this direction here, okay, so I'm going roughly like this, something like that, okay. So this point here has its dual here, this point here, the green one, has its dual here. Dual, I call, that's the polar polarity uh, correspondence of Apollonius. And that has the interesting consequence that this intersection point, that intersection point is going to be, and I'm going to also color it green, that's going to be the dual of the line joining the red one and the green one. It's a very beautiful story, this polarity business. So if we did the same thing with uh, this point here and drew two lines and did uh, diagonal points, we would find that the line that we get was the original green one. Okay, now because this point A lies on this line here, it turns out that the dual of A will pass through this polar point. So in other words, the tangent to the point A, or at the point A of the conic, can be obtained now by joining A to this point that we found. And even though I've only done it sort of roughly, and this is actually not a conic, it's just freehand drawn, you can see that still this is a reasonable estimate to what might be the tangent to the conic at that point A. So this is a purely projective construction. Let me label it. So there's the tangent to the curve C at the point A. And it's a purely a projective construction that Apollonius would have been familiar with. In the 17th century, a remarkable theorem was discovered by Blaise Pascal when he was a teenager that uh, transformed the theory of conics and allowed uh, an alternate, perhaps simplified, way of finding tangents to a conic speed uh, understood. So here is just an overview of that. So here is Pascal's theorem. It relates six points on a conic, and it's a generalization of famous Pappus's theorem for six points formed uh, by three points on two lines. So here's uh, conic points A, B, C, and other points A prime, B prime, C prime. And then we create these auxiliary points that are meets. So if we join uh, A to B prime and A prime to B, they meet at the point C double prime. If we join, uh, say, the Bs and Cs, B, C prime with B prime C, uh, then that, those lines meet at a new point we'll call it A double prime. And finally, if we join the As and the Cs, A, C prime and A prime C, those two lines meet at a new point, B double prime, 
there they are written out in terms of products. So A double prime is the, the meat of this line with this line. Okay? And the theorem is that these three points that we so construct, A double prime, B double prime, and C double prime, are always collinear. Very beautiful, beautiful fact of, uh, of conics, and actually very powerful uh, fact. And in particular, uh, it was sort of then realized that this theorem, when we extend it, or sort of look at the special degenerate case, when two of the points coincide, actually yields tangents. So without going into a lot of details, we'll talk about it in the work problems, but what happens, let's say, if we look at the point A and C prime, if we apply this theorem to the case when A equals C prime. So you can imagine, say, moving C prime around until it gets pretty close to A. What's going to happen? Well, this line A C prime that joins A and C prime, well, that's going to move towards being a tangent. So we can kind of think of the tangent being the, the line A C prime here in the special case when A equals C prime. Okay, so imagine if we sort of rubbed C prime out and replaced uh, A with C prime, so A and C prime are the same. Then what's going to happen is that since we can get at C double prime and A double prime independent of, of, of this line here, um, we're going to be able to find this red line. And if we believe Pascal's theorem, then this point B double prime given by this combination should also lie on that line. So that means that this point B double prime can be found by taking the line here and meeting it with uh, A prime C, which are still a legitimate uh, chord. So once we have B double prime, then we have a point on this imaginary kind of chord, A C prime, and we can just connect A with B double prime and we're going to get this tangent. So the picture would not look like this, it would look different, but the B double prime construction would end up being B down here somewhere, or somewhere on this line that would allow us to draw this tangent. So that's a very quick uh, derivation. For the details, you could look at the work problems. But the point is more or less that finding or constructing tangents, and maybe even defining tangents, was a highly non-trivial thing for 17th century mathematicians, and even earlier mathematicians. They realized that you can't just say, here's a curve and here's a point and consider the tangent. Right? What does that mean? You have to construct the tangent before you can talk about it. That's a very important principle. And here we see that this problem is geometrically non-trivial. It requires some deep understanding of the underlying geometry of the curve that we're talking about. So in this video, we're going to look at an alternate technology, which is algebraic, an algebraic way of dealing with this same geometrical problem, illustrating the power of algebraic thinking to solve or help us understand geometrical situations. Now in classical courses of calculus, tangent lines are often defined and computed as limits of chords or secants. So here's a curve again, and let's say we're interested in tangent at the point A, then what we might do is consider first a secant or a chord that joins A with some other point on the curve, in this case B, as a secant or a chord. And then the idea is, well, let's let B move towards A. And as B moves towards A, this is fixed, then this secant line ought to move towards the tangent. And if B is very close to A, then A and B should determine a line which is pretty close to being a tangent. But it's a rather a delicate thing because as A and B get very close, then uh, it's a, a sensitive thing drawing that tangent line. It's hard to do accurately. But nevertheless, theoretically, this is often the way uh, it, things are approached, and it's, it is an attractive way of thinking, for sure. And it's, it's sort of what we were using a little bit in the Pascal argument as well. But nevertheless, unfortunately, the idea that the tangent line is some kind of limit of secant lines, we might use this uh, notation limit as B approaches A of the secant line AB, that that's somehow a definition of the tangent. That is problematic on logical grounds because for typical curves, this requires an infinite amount of work. You can't actually get at this limit without actually going through an infinite amount of intermediate steps. 
So it's really the result of a process that you have to complete by going to infinity. And in this course, we don't want to do an infinite number of operations. So somehow we have to sidestep this approach and this orientation towards tangent lines. Okay, so that's a, that's a major challenge. And we do that by exploiting the algebraic setup in which we're working. And we're going to be looking at how we can do this kind of thing for curves which are parameterizable, algebraically parameterizable. We'll see that there. We can employ some beautiful trick, really, to get at the tangent purely algebraically. So let me illustrate this idea by an example. So we're going to look at the simple example of a parabola, which is parametrizable. This is what we're talking about y equals x squared. It's parametrizable by t and uh, t squared. So here are two points on the parabola y equals x squared. A is t, t squared, and b is u, u squared. And t and u are some parameter values. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to compute the equation of the chord joining them. And this is something that we've already done in the course, so it'll be familiar to you. And we're going to use projective coordinates because we like that, because then we can use our join of points formula. Okay, so here is the projective version of A, here's the projective version of B, and then we take what's essentially a three-dimensional cross product. I remind you how that goes, so we choose the second one here, the second times the third, minus the third times the second, that's the first component. And then the next one is the first, uh, rather the third times the first, minus the first times the third. So U minus T for the second component. And the third component is the first times the second minus the second times the first. T U squared minus T squared U. Now it turns out that these things here all have this factor T minus U in it. T minus U here, there's a U minus T, there's a U minus T there. And since T and U are assumed to be separate, otherwise it wouldn't make any sense to compute the line joining them, we can divide by u minus t, because u minus t is non-zero. Okay, so the t minus u can be cancelled. Here we cancel and we get a minus 1 sign. And here we cancel, we get a minus t u. So it's the same expression. And then this is a, an equation or a formula for the, the chord joining the general point given by the parameter t and the parameter u. If we want to convert it into a standard equation for a line, here's the affine version. So we take t plus u times x, minus 1 times y, minus t u equals 0. Or if we would like, we could bring the other constant to the other side. t plus u x minus y equals t u. And if we want to rewrite that in more familiar y equals something formula, well, we could bring the y to one side and we get y equals t plus u x minus t u. So that's the equation of a chord that passes through to general points on the parabola. That's of independent interest, I think. So here is a picture of the parabola y equals x squared. The axes are a little bit tilted, that doesn't bother us. There's some familiar points, including the point 2, 4, the point minus 1, 1. And we're interested in, say, in the chord between these two points. That's the case when t equals 2 and u equals minus 1. There's the formula for the chord from the previous slide, and if we set t equals 2 and u equals minus 1, this becomes a, a 1, and this number here becomes uh, minus 2, so altogether we get y equals x plus 2. And that is indeed, you can check, the equation of the line that passes through these two points. y is x plus 2. y is x plus 2. Easy. Now, how do we get at a tangent? Suppose that we're interested in the tangent to this curve at the point 2, 4. In other words, when t equals 2. We're going to perform a very simple-minded kind of uh, trick, I suppose. What we're going to do is we're going to take the equation for the chord and just set the second parameter, u, equal to the t that we're interested in. We only have one point now t equals 2, and we just take this equation and set u equals t in it. So if u equals t, then we get 2t here, so we get 2tx, and if t equals u, then we get uh, minus t squared. So this is now an equation that does only have the parameter t in it, not t and u. 
And the claim is that this is the equation of the tangent at the point parameterized by t. Now you might say, well, isn't this sort of like a limit? Like what we're really doing is we're letting you approach t. And you can think about it that way. You can think about it, certainly. That we're thinking about the u as varying, and the varying could, you know, proceed, and u is getting closer and closer to t. And in the limit, sort of u equals t. But notice that actually what we're prescribing here does not involve any limiting process. We're just saying, take the equation of the chord and set u equal to t. Replace u with t. Completely finite algebraic manipulation that doesn't necessarily need to be connected with any kind of infinite process that we may have in our mind. Okay, we may have some interpretation, but we don't need to have the algebra reflect that. The algebra is just cut and dry. In particular, when t equals 2, this becomes y equals 4x minus 4, and you can check that that's a reasonable uh, equation for a tangent. It's a line with uh, y-intercept minus 4, so it goes through this point here. Its slope is 4. That's usually sort of associated with the derivative of the function and so on. But notice that we're not, we're not relying on any prior theory of derivatives here. Okay? We haven't gotten there yet. Okay? This is just pure algebra, just exploiting what we know about joins of points and then setting u equal to t. Okay? And we get more than the derivative, even if you know what that means. We're getting really the tangent line itself. And it's the tangent line which is really the crucial object, not its slope. Slope is interesting, but so are a lot of things. So is the y-intercept or the x-intercept or whatever you know, else we might be interested in. But it's the equation of the tangent itself which is of primary interest. All right, so now here is the the strategy. The strategy for finding a tangent to a parameterized curve, gamma, there's the curve gamma, we're assuming it's parameterized, at a point A corresponding to a parameter value t. And we would like to get at this tangent line. First of all, define what it is and compute it. And here's our strategy. First, find the equation of the chord for general parameters t and u. t, u, general parameters, find the equation of the chord joining those two points on the curve. So now what we do is we cancel factors of t minus u. We have some expression for the chord, and that expression will typically be factorizable in terms of t minus u, because when t equals u, then the whole process of finding a uh, chord between two points breaks down. So if you think about the, the process of taking the uh, the product of a, a projective point with another projective point. You know, these sort of A, B minus C, D terms that we get um, in, the, in the product. Each of those is going to be zero if the two points are actually the same. And that's telling us that T minus U is going to be a factor. So we can cancel those T minus U factors. There is a perhaps small but non-zero probability that there might actually be t minus u factors to some higher power, like maybe t minus u squared is in each one of those three expressions, in which case we should cancel all of them. Okay, so cancel as many t minus u's as we can. After we've done that, then we set u equal to t. So up to this stage here, we were assuming that u and t were different. But once we have the equation of the chord, then we can remove the common factor t minus u, and then we can replace the u with t. And we get an equation for the tangent line to the curve at the point A, parameterized by t. And it's a completely algebraic process. And it's a lot of fun. Right? So we can take algebraically parameterized curves, and we can play this game, and you can see that it works, and it works beautifully, and we get equations for tangents. So there's a lot of fun to be had now, because we can employ this technology, which is pretty simple-minded, really, to accomplish some really dramatic things. We can make calculations that the 17th century people would have been quite impressed with. But I remind you that this is rather in the special case when we have a curve which has a parameterization. That's our starting point. So for curves which don't have parameterizations, or for curves that we don't know parameterizations of, we may have to introduce, and we will have to introduce, a different technology. But nevertheless, for this parameterizable situation, which is still very important for us, 
this is a great uh, way of doing things. So here's some examples. And the details are all worked out in the work problems and there's a lot more interesting examples for you to have a go. So let's say y equals x squared. We've already done that, but I'm going to just restate it in terms of projective uh, coordinates, which I find attractive. So here's the parameterization uh, projectively. So there's the x equals t, y equals t squared, and we put a, a one third spot. And here is the equation of the uh, tangent line that we've got. It was actually y equals 2tx um, minus t squared. Okay, but we've sort of written it as 2tx minus y minus t squared equals zero. That's the way of interpreting this projective form of a line. Okay, so now we can go ahead and do the same kind of thing for other curves. For example, for y equals x cubed, there's a parameterization for it. And there's the equation of the tangent line at the point where the parameter is t. It's 3t squared minus 1 minus 2t cubed. Those of you who have done calculus before, you will recognize 2t is sort of like the derivative of x squared evaluated at t. This thing is like the derivative of x cubed evaluated at t, etc. But really, there's no need to know anything about derivatives for this to happen. y equals 1 over x, our nice hyperbola. Here's a parameterization for it. Now, usually we would say, well, the parameterization is t comma 1 over t. So t 1 over t 1. But if we have a denominator, we can clear the denominator by multiplying by t. And if we do that, we would get t squared 1 and t. And then here, it turns out, is the equation for the tangent line at this point. It's 1 t squared minus 2t. Here's a circle, the unit circle, x squared plus y squared equals 1. Here's the familiar rational parameterization expressed projectively. So instead of having 1 minus t squared over 1 plus t squared and 2t over 1 plus t squared, we've factored out that common denominator and put it in the third spot. Okay, it's an attractive aspect. The projective coordinates allow us to do this. And it turns out that the tangent at this point has this form here, somewhat similar, minus 1 plus t squared to minus 2t to 1 plus t squared. When we go to the hyperbola, sort of in red geometry, x squared minus y squared equals 1, a relativistic hyperbola, then its parameterization is this, very much like this one, except these two have swapped places. And the equation of the tangent line is very much like this, except for these two having swapped places. So a very pleasant symmetry becomes uh, apparent uh, when we go from the unit circle in the Euclidean situation to the unit circle in the relativistic situation. And a somewhat more exotic example, this is a semi-cubical parabola, y squared equals x cubed, which has parameterization t squared t cubed 1. If we use this parameterization, then the corresponding tangent line has the form minus 3t squared to minus 2t to minus t to the fourth. This is a little bit uh, special. It's uh, well worth thinking about what happens here, especially when t equals 0. When t equals 0, we're at the origin. Something special is happening there because when we set t equals 0 here, we get a proportion 0 to 0 to 0, which is not allowed for proportions. That's not a legitimate equation of, uh, of a line. So there's something special happening at 0, and that's really a, a reflection of the fact that the tangent is... Um, problematic to define at that point. Okay, so these are good examples for you to work through, but uh, also in the work problems in the course, uh, you'll see um, them there. And there's really a lot of uh, now interesting calculations that we can make with this technology, and uh, we can use these tangents to solve all kinds of interesting problems. So there's much to learn. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.